Greetings from the Jingle Truck. Where can you go to see the amusing poetry of Pakistan? Any place we travel in Chattanooga or around Tennessee. Poems adorn our vehicle to let people know that mother's prayers are the breezes of heaven and to not tailgate because if you get any closer, we might fall in love. Enjoy the Southern Festival of Books from your Jingle Truck friends here at Art 120. Hi, good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome on behalf of Humanities Tennessee. I'm RJ Jacobs, and I'll be moderating tonight's session with Joe Hill and Paul Tremblay. Uh, I'll start by giving both authors an introduction, and then I'll ask a few questions to get the ball rolling, and then we'll welcome some questions from the audience. We'll have about 45 minutes, and we'll wrap up about 8.30. And before we start, I'd like to thank our key sponsors. Uh, Metro Nashville Arts Commission, Ingram Content Group, Tennessee Arts Commission, Vanderbilt University, and Parnassus Books. Uh, and please note that there are links posted to support the author's books through Parnassus Books. And there's also a donate button that should be uh, at the bottom if people wish to donate to the festival. Um, I guess I wanna start by introducing both authors. First, I'll start with Paul. Paul Tremblay uh, has won the Bram Stoker British Fantasy and Massachusetts Book Awards and is the author of The Cabin at the End of the World. The Disappearance at Devil's Rock, A Head Full of Ghosts, uh, Crime Novels, The Little Sleep, and No Sleep to Wonderland, and the short story collection, Growing Things and Other Stories. He is currently a member of the board of directors of the Shirley Jackson Awards, and his essays in short fiction have appeared in the Los Angeles Times, Entertainment Weekly Online, and numerous best, year's best anthologies. He has a master's degree in mathematics and lives outside Boston with his family. His new novel is Survivor's Song. Uh, Joe Hill. Joe Hill is the number one New York Times bestselling author of the novels The Fireman, uh, Nosferatu, Horns, and Heart Shaped Box. Strange Weather, his collection of novellas, and the prize-winning short story collection, 20th Century Ghosts. He is also the Eisner Award-winning writer of a six-volume comic book series, Lock and Key. Much of his work has been adapted for film and TV, including Nosferatu, Lock and Key, and In the Tall Grass. His new book is Full Throttle, a dark and ingenious collection of 13 compelling short stories that showcase his ability to push the genre conventions to new extremes. Welcome. Thank yeah, you, Arjun. Um, I guess uh, we'll be taking some questions from the audience, but I guess I wanted to just kind of start by kind of asking a few basic questions to sort of get everything going. Uh, the first question I had is, was actually for Paul. Paul, I was wondering, this is probably an inevitable question, one that you've probably gotten a few times, but I'm wondering, uh, as I got more familiar with your book, what it was like to have a book about a race for a vaccine and a quarantine being out right now during this time when the, the virus is so rampant. What's that been like? Uh, what's that been like? Uh, it's been, I don't know, uh, even more bizarre than usual to have a book out and people talking about it, obviously. Um, I, I wrote the novel from July, 2018 to I turned in my final edits to my editor. Joe and I share the same editor, wonderful Jennifer Brell. Turned them in October 2019. So, um, you know, you know, there's some weird quote unquote prescient stuff that happens in the book that's all credit, you know, due to my my sister who I use as research for the medical parts of it. But uh, no, it's been strange. I mean, like the the strangest part I think was just strange for everybody was when we first went into quarantine in Massachusetts or lockdown you know, mid-March, you know, Joe, you probably get asked this too. Oh, as horror writers, you guys are probably really prepared for like this end of the world apocalypse stuff. I was like, no, no, I, 
I, I'm a worst case scenario guy. That's what I write about. So my first two weeks in March were spent on the couch watching Animal Planet and uh, Mythbusters in a, in a sort of metaphorical fetal position. You know, I, I did not handle the, the early part of it well. Not that I'm ha handling the, the now part of it well either. But You know, so I write, I write comic books and I got boxes and boxes of my own comics in the basement. Um, you know, and I have to tell you, when we hit the great toilet paper crisis of 2020, I was feeling pretty good about having, uh, you know, having all that, those back issues. Suddenly they yeah. were looking like a, you know, um, really useful resource to have on hand. <laughs> um, I guess I wonder what the pandemic has been like for you guys in terms of your creativity. A lot of people have said that it's sort of chewed up some bandwidth for them or has been so stressful that it's been hard to focus on their work. Um, but also as writers, you know, there is the advantage of having a bit more free time on your hands with fewer distractions or having to go into an office or anything, more time on your hands. What's it been like to kind of write during the pandemic? Paul, you want to go first? Want to go first, Joe? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I definitely feel I've been less productive it's been very difficult and it sort of goes in ebbs and flows sort of depending on what's happening in the news. You know, I, uh, you know, when May rolled around and things were better COVID wise and that started to get better COVID wise in my area of the country, you know, I picked up a little bit, but then, you know, with the murder of George Floyd and, and Breonna Taylor, um, you know, my, my June, I mean, there were bigger problems in the world, but I, you know, I couldn't get anything done in June. So it, it's been a struggle. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm very fortunate that I have a new book deal and I have a deadline, you know, a book due in May. So, you know, if nothing else that forces me to sit down and shut off Twitter and, and other, you know, and, and online news outlets, you know, to try to work on the book, but it's been hard. I mean, I think for myself that, you know, um, the work playing make believe is like my safe place. It's where mm -hmm. I naturally go when I'm stressed out. You know, the two things that I've always been able to do to sort of um, uh, clear the mechanism to feel better, to feel more grounded is is write and make stuff up or, you know, or settle into a binge read, settle into some, you know, uh, find a book that, that really gets its claws into me. Mm -hmm. So I would say that creatively the year has been fine. I mean, it's been as a work year, it's been fine. Mm -hmm. In terms of life, uh, it's, you know, it's been hard. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, there's two, the, you know, the relentless onslaught of crisis right. um, is, I mean, it wears on everyone. And I mean, I think, you know, but the funny thing is, is that, you know, you get these intensifying crises and, and there is a part of me which watches stuff like the home edit or the Great British mm -hmm. Bake Off, because it's soothing. But yeah, then there's sure. another part of me, there's another part of me that wants, you know, books by Harlan Coben, that wants, you sure. know, uh, uh, books by, you know, Peter Straub, that wants books by Paul Tremblay, that wants to read Cyber Sun. And like the thing that I wonder about, and maybe Paul can tackle this, you know, I, I, it's like writers get a lot, horror writers get this question. They get it all the time which is what happened to you to screw you up and make mm -hmm. you want to write about this stuff? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, like, like, but I sort of have a different twist on that question. You know, Survivor Song is about rabies and rabies is real and it's really scary. I mean, it's scarier than Jason. It's scarier than great white sharks. It's scarier than the upcoming election. And like, what's wrong with people like me that I want to read a book like that? You know, why do we feel compelled to imagine our way into these stories? I don't know. You know, there's a lot of readers. I I'm among them who wants this kind of fiction and it doesn't seem to matter what's going on in the world. Totally. I, I, uh, uh, it, I, I would say just briefly, I mean, because he, he mentioned Peter Straub, like after those first two difficult weeks, and I had a hard time reading a few things. The thing that broke me through uh, was rereading Peter Straub's The Throat, which is certainly not... <laughs> I don't think anyone's ever described Peter Straub's The Throat as comfort food reading. But I don't know. At that moment, it was sort of a rediscovery that, you know, I don't read for pleasure. I read to be, mm -hmm. uh, if that makes sense. Um, 
and so that was really the first thing that I had to try to, you know, just take my anxiety and, you know, just, you know, global panic to try to, 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 to wrestle that to the ground a little bit was to, you know, go back to the things, you know, that in some ways, you know, define who I am, or at least a big part of my life anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, we're living in extreme times. I hate the word uncertain times, like uh, like everybody else. I think the horror writers and horror fans were screaming during that first month was, we've always lived in uncertain times. Granted, things are, are heightened to 11 right now, but um, I don't know, to me, that's the truth of horror. I mean, when people say that, you know, they don't want to read those kind of books, I'm like, why not? I mean, horror's, you know, I think when it's done right, when it's the, at its best, it's really honest about difficult things. Uh, yeah, yeah. And often in very empathic ways too. Mm -hmm. Guys, you you um, brought up reading horror and sort of the themes of horror. Uh, a question for you both that I kind of wondered was, do you read other genres? Are there other things maybe that nobody would even expect that you kind of get into or dig every once in a while? I mean, I mostly read other genres. I, I actually, you know, um, it's funny. I was talking, uh, talking with my wife about this just last night, you know, um, um, I, I write a lot of horror fiction. I mean, I like to think of myself as genre fluid because I've written crime, I've written science fiction, you know, I've written fantasy and Paul's the same way. He hasn't limited himself to just one genre, but I have to admit, I love horror. I've done a lot of work in horror. Um, but boy, I don't read that much of it anymore. I, I used to, you know, I read a lot of historical fiction. I read a lot of thrillers. You know, um, I need suspense. You know, I really crave suspenseful fiction. Um, uh, you know, again, just to go, you know, this this month I've discovered Harlan Coben. I've been totally blown away. You know, I, I watched uh, The Stranger on Netflix and, you know, uh, it was it just electric. It totally gripped me. And I'm like, I got to see if the books are this good. The books are even better. I'm reading, you know, Gone for Good. And I, I can't put it, you know, it's I, I get to the point where I'm, you know, start to resent other things getting in the way of my time to read that book. Um, so, but I think I read a lot more when I was younger. I still love horror films. Um, and, and now and then I will read a book, you know, um, Josh Mallerman is terrific. And, and I usually read when he's got something new, I usually read it. Um, you know, when Paul's got something new, I usually read it. Um, but, um, maybe it's, maybe it's because it's so much a part of what I do um then when i'm reading i want to turn to something else sure yeah sure um yeah i mean i probably read mostly horror i mean my my view of horror is sort of like a, a big wide umbrella so maybe i include some things in horror that other people wouldn't but i won't go down that road um i think second place i probably read a lot of just uh, what would be described as maybe literary fiction mm -hmm. um I, I've been dipping a lot more into nonfiction, just random topics, uh, and doing those through audiobooks. When I walk my dogs, I'm usually walking like mm -hmm. 45 minutes a day. So it's a fun way to do audiobooks, I think. I think maybe the one kind of book that might surprise people, uh, you know, I'm a I'm a big sports fan and I enjoy a good, you know, sports, you know, bio book or just a sports book mm -hmm. in general. I'm trying to think of the last one I read. Um, I don't know, like, you know, silly regional stuff. Like, well, not silly, but like Pedro Martinez's, you know, biography. I love Pedro. Um, I love Pedro. Or man. something like David Peace, <laughs> like this wonderful British crime writer, David Peace, has written some soccer football books. And he wrote one called uh, The Dan's United, which is just wonderful. Um, it's about this British manager who sort of, uh, for, for our, our American audience here, there was some British manager named Brian Clough, and he's sort of like Bill Parcells and, and Belichick sort of smushed together. He just like, you know, would hammer the press and the, the, the Brits ate it up. Uh, and he brought the small club to fame, uh, Derby. And he hated, at the time, the biggest club was Leeds. But he ended up getting hired by Leeds. And he was only there for like 55 days. It was a total shit show. Um, and the, and the, it's a novelization of that story of the 55 days where he knew, like he even felt like he was – working for the enemy. So there's a question of whether he undermined everything on purpose, but you know, and David Peace, this really great crime writer, it's, there's like suspense to it. It's, it's a really wonderful book. Two, just two things and, and not to step on. I know we've got questions to get to, but just, just, right. gotta, just quick things. Okay. So one of my big guilty pleasures is I read a lot of rock and roll books. Yeah. You know, I read Bruce Springsteen's bio. I, I loved it. You know, I thought born to run was a great book. Um, 
uh, I read. I read usually about one book about the Beatles every year. Last year it was Beatles vs. Stones. This year it was Dreaming the Beatles. Oh, yeah, I love it. You know, I just read a lot of rock stuff, you know. Um, um, uh, Paul, David P., did he do the Red Riding trilogy? And did you read yes. it? I don't think it's yep. it's not a trilogy, right? It's like four books. It's a quartet. Yeah, yeah, yeah quartet. Wait. And was good. Yes. Um, it's funny the there's a BBC miniseries that's three, <laughs> but he wrote four books. So like it, the it BBC is, thing is a trilogy. It is about the hunt for a serial killer, and it's four books, and it's spread across like ten yep. years, right? So I kind of love that because because when books usually are about the hunt for a serial killer. They tend to pick one detective and make that the main character and follow that character until that that mm -hmm. detective catches the serial killer at the end of the book. And the right. truth is that that real life hunts for serial murderers, for sequence killers, um, tend to be spread across a decade or two and involve multiple investigators and people with different skill sets. And I don't know that that's what the David Peace books do, but I kind of love the idea that they do just because it seems like such a more authentic representation of what that work is like. Yeah, it does. I mean, I think it follows uh, a, a case based on real life, um, but also the, the BBC three, three movie miniseries. It's one to me. It's like one of the best like series of books and series of movies. Like in terms of like, really, they're both really wonderful. Yeah, really great British actors. Um, I'm gonna, I, I forget half their names, but including uh, Bean. His last name is Bean. He played uh, Sean Stark. Bean. <laughs> yeah, Sean Bean. Sean Bean's yeah, in yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's great. He's died um, like he's died like uh, uh, in almost every film he's ever been in. And yes. also, if you just yeah. want to entertain folks at home, <laughs> just want to entertain themselves for seven minutes, if they just want to feel better about the word, about the world. Google Sean Bean bastard supercut. It's a supercut Sean Be Bean saying bastard in like 50 different movies. Apparently it's like the word he said most in in like his film career. And he, he nails it every time. It's like one of his great expressions. Bastard. So I highly recommend. I highly recommend checking it out. Um, you guys, there is a a question from Tracy from Delaware, and she's eager to know um, about things in real life that are very scary to you. Mm. Oh, besides rabies. everything? Rabies. <laughs> rabies. Rabies is, is messed up, man. Yeah. Rabies can up. kill you. Rabies can kill you from fear. It because it messes your brain up and it gets every it it. You know, and, and people die from terror when they have that. Can you imagine a more awful way to die? I can't. I can't. Yeah, no. I, I'm scared of sharks. Yeah. <laughs> Corgis are scary. Corgis are not scary. Uh, it's I'm supposed scared. to be a fox, my rabbit fox. Uh, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm scared of sharks, and I've seen Jaws like 30 times. And even when I'm swimming in a lake, I can close my eyes and picture the shark coming up beneath me and kind of scare myself. Mm -hmm. Even though the lake is fresh water, you know? Oh yeah. Same. I, my father took me to see Jaws when I was 10 going on 11. It was on a big screen, but not in a cinema. It was at our local high school. For some reason they were showing Jaws. And you know, the best part of this was my dad totally undersold the movie to me. He said, Hey, we're going to go see this movie called Jaws. There's a scene in it that captures the feeling of what it's like to catch a fish while you're fishing, <laughs> fishing better than any other movie you've ever seen. Now, he was correct. You know, the scene where Quint's eye in the line, where it starts to tick, yeah, that really captures fishing. But yeah. uh, <laughs> the rest of the movie, particularly when Quint dies, uh, yeah, you know, me. I literally had, from age 10 to 16, maybe even 17, embarrassingly, shark nightmares almost every week. Every dream I would have, I would end up in the water and get attacked by a shark. But zombie it hasn't stopped nightmares. me watching the movie. Yeah, I had a lot did. of zombie but, nightmares. Yeah. So, yeah, what else? Perfect. I mean, Tracy... Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say there have been three perfect works of art released in my lifetime. I don't know if Paul will agree with this or not, but I three that I know of. Jaws, Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell, What's the Story, Morning Glory by Oasis. That's it. There's three times. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Who's everyone? Oh, you I'm deserve to get booted off for mentioning Oasis as a perfect album. Yeah, I think. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Oh, will you stop. Yeah. No, that's I can, you know, old, I'm an old cranky punk, so I would choose Zen Arcade by Husker Du as my favorite you know, piece oh. of perfect art. Um, we'll go with Jaws, though. 
uh, book. I don't know. I might choose House of Leaves or or uh, uh, We've Always Lived in the Castle. I don't know. Uh oh, someone asked, "What if I decided what I'm going to do with Up to Me Down yet?" I don't think Up to Me Down is going to be the next book, guys. There was I did talk about a book I was working on. I got a couple hundred pages of Up to Me Down. I really like what I got. I don't think it's the next book. I'm I'm working on something else right now. Joe, I had a question for you, and you were kind of making a distinction before about being a reader and a writer, and kind yeah. of participating in both ways. And yeah. it kind of made me wonder about the process of co-writing and what that's been like for you. Oh yeah, so um, so um, my so my new collection is full throttle. It's a collection of thirteen stories. Actually, it's fourteen because I hit a story in the back. Um, um, and I wrote I wrote uh, two of them with my dad. Um, my dad is also an up and coming writer. Um, he's he's had a couple books um, that have done pretty well, um, and he shows tremendous promise. And and you know I'm hoping he'll stick with it. Um, because I think, you know, there's no telling, you know, sky's the limit, um, in a lot of ways, but so we wrote a, you know, um, my dad and I wrote a story together called Throttle. Um, there was a spin on Richard Matheson's, uh, novel Duel, which was also made into a film by Steven Spielberg, was Steven Spielberg's first film. And then dad and I also wrote a story called In the Tall Grass, which is in full throttle. And that was made into a Netflix film directed by Vincenzo Natale. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I've said this a bunch of times, but you know, the experience of writing with my dad is, uh, uh, a little bit like something out of the Roadrunner cartoons. You know, I, I feel like while I, while E. Coyote unpacking a rocket and lighting the fuse and climbing on top, you know, and going after the Roadrunner, my dad is the rocket, you know, he's just, it's just this incredible forward motion and all you kind of do is hang on for life. Um, so this is a great moment to note that Full Throttle is now out in trade paperback and you can order your copy from Parnassus Books, a great American independent bookstore. Why exactly there? It. Why not? Why not stop and, and get Survivor Song by Paul Tremblay? <laughs> um, and, and if you're feeling it, go ahead and get the entire <laughs> David Peace Quartet, Red Riding uh, Quartet. Got them all in there stock. They'll, they're happy to deliver those books right to your door. Do it. <laughs> uh, Paul, I had a question for you, and it's about technology. One thing I noticed in your book is that you kind of make use of some technology. There's one part where people are having conversations via text, and I think some writers kind of don't know how to handle that or how to integrate modern communication into a story. Can you talk a little bit about your decision to do that or like kind of what that's been like? Sure. Um, so, I don't know especially when I first started sort of in the horror community, the horror writing community, which we, which can be kind of small and insular. And I don't know if this is specific to horror or genre fiction in general. Um, but, you know, there's a sentiment like, oh, like you have to work on, or you have to write a story with the idea of deathless prose in mind, which to me is like the most ridiculous thing like I think any writer could ever think of. Like, where's the line for deathless prose? Is it, you know, what year? Is it 19, is it before cell phones? Is it before... I don't know, Walkman, is it before like a, a refrigerator that you didn't have to stock, you know, with ice? Like there's no such thing as deathless prose. So, um, you know, it's hard enough to worry about writing a story that is going to affect, you know, people emotionally today. So I'm always just thinking about you know, how am I going to best serve the story? I'm trying to hook readers of right now, you know, whether or not like 50 years from now, mutant mole people are, are still going to be around to read our stories. You know, I don't know. Um, you know, so that said, I really try to make sure that if I put something in like a text exchange or, or you know, a reference to Twitter or something like that, you know, it just can't be there for show. It, it has to be there to serve a purpose. It has to sort of help build the story. Um, and it's re it, I, I look at it almost as world building. You know, for example, um, William Gibson's Neuromancer. You know, for for many people of a, of an age much younger than me, you know, if you read that first paragraph or the first line where the sky is. The, the sky is gray, like it's tuned to a dead, you know, TV channel or something like that. You know, you may not necessarily know what that means, but within the context of the story, it's perfect and it builds. It's it builds still Neuromancer's world. You know, it, it's not dated in the least. Um, so I think if you do your job as a writer, make whatever references you're making, like they have to be important, integral parts of the story. Then it sort of takes care of itself. If that makes sense. Total. Sense. Yeah, it means. Sooner or later, all fiction becomes historical fiction. Even sure. science fiction, 
written in the past but set in the future eventually becomes historical fiction because when you look at a buck rogers comic strip from the 1920s you were seeing the past's idea of the future um you know and that doesn't ruin the story often it enhances it I, i've been talking to harlan coben because i'm really into him right now listen to this line this is from gone for good you can also order harlan coben from parnassus books folks uh, they got the entire library in stock um but so there's at one point they're scanning this dead the fingerprints of this this corpse they found the cops and they're scanning it and uploading it to something called the internet and hmm. one of the cops says it's like a xerox machine and a fax machine in one um and and you know i love that a book was written in 2002 you know and it instantly sort of places you in a moment when everything was changing doesn't ruin the story it's it's fun it's you know it's um um you know it makes it uh more of its time and so more pleasurable is it just it's just another level you can enjoy the story on yeah R really quickly if you want if you if you rewatch alien the original alien now like you know the spaceships are beautiful and amazing you know and everything is like wow that could be the future except for any time they show a computer screen it looks like pong you know uh -huh. <laughs> that, kind of, that kind of level of uh graphics but i don't know well, in, I in that movie it totally works obviously i have a thing in uh lock and key um where one kid is talking to another kid about what he did in computer class and he says i made a myspace page and <laughs> i just think and it, when i put it in there i meant it to show that he kind of didn't really know much about computers or even why you'd spend a lot of time on a computer you know and and but it really dates the story. It shows when I wrote the story because in you know 2008, mm. MySpace was still a thing, you know. But my feeling is I wouldn't change it. It gets funnier with every passing year. <laughs> um, guys, there's a question um, from a teacher uh, who teaches fifth grade, and every now and then gets a kid who writes great horror, usually a girl. Uh, I think they feel embarrassed about it, but I encourage it because they have. Uh, excellent creativity, even if they're not writing about mermaids and princesses. The question is, um, did you enjoy writing scary stories when you were little? Paul? Um, I came to writing and even reading much later than I think than most other writers. I was, uh, you know, I was a math major in college. Like my, really for, I was a good high school student, or I should say I was a good boy. Like I did all, everything the teachers asked. Um, you know, I was a pretty lonely kid, but, you know, so I would come home and just watch, I mean, for me, I came home from school and watched cable. I watched <laughs> all the movies on HBO. I watched MASH. I watched, you know, horror movies. So I didn't really fall in love with reading until my early 20s. Mm -hmm. So I was a math guy. But for me, that was like this amazing discovery. And I feel like I've always been trying to play catch up since because I came to, to reading for pleasure so late in life compared to most. Um, and part, partly that drives me. So yeah, I, I really don't have the experience, sorry, of, of, mm -hmm. of writing as a kid. I wish I did. I, I would say that, you know, any kid who starts out by writing horror fiction um, should be encouraged. And, and it's worth saying to that kid that you're starting just the right place. Because one of the big questions, you know, when you're writing fiction is, um, you know, great fiction that keeps people turning the pages is about, is partially, it's about suspense. And it's about characters who act, characters who have a strong reason to um, pursue something or do something. It's about active protagonists. And horror almost always answers that question. Why is the, you know, why is the character doing this? Why is that woman running through the woods? Well, the answer is there's a guy behind her with a chainsaw. You know, so horror fiction has a tendency to put things in motion very rapidly and then and then you know and then keep them there for 10 pages or 30 pages or 300 pages or 900 pages um and and also also you know with any work of fiction the question is why would anyone read it you know why does anyone why why does anyone choose this book instead of something on youtube or something on their playstation or you know whatever and the answer to that question is usually suspense um it's wanting to know what happens next what's going to happen next and mm. and horror is the 
genre of fiction where suspense is turned as turned up as high as it can go. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, and that's certainly always been one of the reasons why it appealed to me. I think because I'm I'm pretty insecure, you know, and I'm always worried people will get bored and stop reading. And so I'm always looking like, how can I how can I increase the sense of peril? How can I make things even worse for the character in this situation? Um, you know, it's sort of that's my reflexive go to as a writer. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a question. Um, I know you guys are friends. There's a question that sort of is similar to the question that I had about whether or not you guys ever bounce ideas off of each other. The question is any chance you guys would ever collaborate on a novel? Well, j- briefly, we already have in a way. Um, um, I did a comic book called Plunge for DC. <laughs> with DC, I did a set of um, graphic novels uh, under the this sort of Hill House Comics imprint. And I wrote a couple of them, and some great writers jumped in um, to write some other ones. Carmen Maria Machado. Um, Terrific, you know, National Book Award nominated writer did a graphic novel called The Lolo Woods. M.R. Carey, who's a friend of mine and wrote The Girl with All the Gifts. Um, he did one called The Dollhouse Family. Uh, uh, a screenwriter named Laura Marks um, came in and worked with, you know, the incredible artist Kel Jones to do Daphne Byrne. So we did a whole set of them. And I did one called Plunge, which is kind of a riff on John Carpenter's The Thing. And there are some some dudes um, who are on this island in the Bering Strait, and they've been attacked by some kind of parasite, and they're all blind. But but a lot, although they've lost their powers of sight, they have gained other powers, including fantastic mathematical skills. And each chapter of Plunge began with an equation. Um, and Paul, because Paul's, you know, a math whiz, I had Paul supply me with the coolest equations he could think of um, for three or four of those chapters. So um, I'm never afraid to lean on a friend when I need help. <laughs> and I think your your family owes me some math tutoring money because you've asked me and then your up and coming father for the institution ran by uh, a, a, an SAT problem that he had to put into the did novel he? early on as well. Oh, yes, he's he terrible. <laughs> um, this is a question for you both, but Joe, I was intrigued a little bit when you're talking about the three perfect works of art. Yeah. Um, we're talking a lot about writing in books, but if you had to pick another art form to express your creativity, what do you think it'd be? I mean, I wish it was rock and roll. You know, I, I mean, I just think when I'm like, you know, novels rock i mean rocks like more kind of up here i just think i think music is the central art form and everyone who can't do music has you know who wants to be in the arts has to find some way to scuffle along in some other field <laughs> no music for me definitely uh when i first started my i mentioned i you know sort of felt, you know found reading in my early 20s at the same time uh, i had bought a guitar and was teaching myself to play and so for you know, for really the mid nineties, I was messing around with writing, but also, you know, messing around with, with music too. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, if I had a time machine, if I could go back and change things and say, Hey, you could be a punk, you know, a punk metal or rock, you know, star, I would choose that in a heartbeat. Josh um, Mallerman, I, I, Mallerman's got a rock band and they've like had songs. Like, uh, I think one of their songs is like the theme song for is always sunny in Philadelphia or something like that. Or, or yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. He's a so nice I, guy, I, but that we should still beat yeah. him up in an alley or something because that's just like that's yeah. too talented. I mean, he wrote Bird Box and he writes songs. Nah, screw that. Yeah. He's a beat. I He's still a I still play around on my guitar, but I'm a hack. But that's been like that's sort of like a nice uh, other escape that I have is just you know yeah. playing my electric guitar really loudly. Poor I want to jump in. I just want to jump in real quick yeah. and say actually, there's been four perfect works of art in my lifetime. Paul, the other one would probably be uh, the Black Smoke Rising EP by Greta Van Fleet. Oh, nice. Haven't heard it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, Paul, there's a question. Um, did the two teen boys in Survivor song also appear in Disappearance? Were they recurring characters? Uh, yeah. Spoiler alert, I guess. But yes, Josh and Luis from Disappearance of Devil's Rock uh, do make an appearance in Survivor song. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I want to say too much more for people who haven't read it, but these are a couple of in Survivor Song, there's a couple of yeah, 17 or 18 year old teenage boys. 
um, and disappeared to Devil's Rock. They were about 13 years old. Joe, I was trying to read your expression there. <laughs> well, I mean, I just, uh, I just think that's so cool. <laughs> Um, Joe, a question for you. Uh, full Throttle is short stories. Can you talk a little bit about the difference in form between taking on a short story and a fuller length novel? One thing that I, I, I read that you had written was uh, Heart Shaped Box sort of started out as a short story and then expanded. It made me yeah. curious. About that. When, I, when I was writing, that was back like uh, in 2000. 2003 um, and I was writing short stories that kept trying to turn into novels on me so I wrote one called Bobby Conroy Comes Back from the Dead that is sort of a it's actually um, a little bit of an oddball for me it's a, uh, a, a romance it's about um, a couple that meet on the set of Dawn of the Dead in 1978 where they both signed up to be zombies for a day and they knew each other in high school and they sort of rekindle the old flame but it's like sort of more of a rom-com. It's like a it's like a rom-com with rotting flesh, um, you know. So um, and that almost became a novel. And I sometimes think how strange my my life would have been if my first novel had been Bobby Conroy comes back from the dead <laughs> instead of Heart Shaped Box. Uh, another one, The Black Phone, wanted to be like 120 pages long, and I forced it to be 30. Um, I mean, um, what I love about short stories is I think I come up with a lot more ideas than I can actually write. You know, um, the ideas are sort of the easy part, but it takes me three years to write a novel. And even a short story, a good short story usually takes me about a month. You know, I'm very slow. Um, and But still, if I do a short story, you know, I can get something out there that I like and that that captures the feel of something without spending three years of my life on it. So um, that's one of the things I like about shorts. Yeah. Um, I, I was just going to plug my own short story collection that came out the same day as Survivor Song. At Part growing, things. Uh, growing Things and Other Stories. Um, I've never had the the short thing blow up into a big novel. Like typically, I've, I guess I've always been fortunate to know before I start that, oh, this is a short story. You know, this is going to be a novel. I tend to plan out the novels more. The short stories are more sort of like you described, a little bit more spontaneous, and it's really sort of like a snapshot. But uh, what, what I have done, though, is with novels, I've often gone back to stories and either cannibalized them or incorporated some of the short story. You know, with my novel, A Head Full of Ghosts, when I was writing, I was like, oh, I have these two sisters. I'm going to have the older sister tell the younger sister stories. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go back and use the short story I wrote called Growing Things, you know, that I wrote in like 2010. And so that story ended up becoming actually a really big part of um, the novel, A Head Full of Ghosts. So mm -hmm. it was kind of fun to revisit that short story to put it back out with that collection. Um, so I don't know, I've done that a few times. You've ever cannibalized something or, or shorter work? I mean, and, all the time. A, a, lot of, yeah. a lot of my books, a lot of my books have actually secretly been best of collections in the sense of being the best bits of books I couldn't finish. You know, um, uh, I spent like three years writing a book called The Fear Tree. Um, I wrote a bunch of books I couldn't publish, you know, between about 1995 and 2005. Um, and the one I spent the most time on and I think the best was The Fear Tree. Um, I spent three years on that. I couldn't sell it anywhere. Um, but there were concepts in it that I thought were pretty shiny that I really liked. And um, the reason I would never, you know, I would never want the Fear Tree published now is because I cannibalize all the best bits for horns. Hmm. Um, guys, there's a question about what you all are working on right now. Uh, I got a book going. It's sizzling. It's going good. All right. <laughs> That's all you yeah, want to I do. That's all I want to say. I don't. You no, know, no title, I, nothing. I yeah. talked about. I talked. I got a pretty good title, but I. I'm not going to say anything because what if it stalls? I mean, I. I talked right. a little bit. I made the mistake of talking about um, up the chimney down, which is this thing that I got a couple hundred pages of, and like sometimes I'm thinking, mm, I wonder if up the chimney down is really a comic book. I mean, I hope this is an okay to work way to work. I, I don't know if it is. There was. Hmm. I mean, David Mitchell talked about writing the Thousand Autumns of Jacob de Zoot. And he talked about writing the fifth draft of it and getting to the end thinking, I think it's pretty good, but I think it ought to be a third person <laughs> and, and starting again, you know, and I'm a little bit like that. Like, uh, you, uh, you know, it, the only way to find something's working is just to write it. And a lot of times, 
you know, I may discover halfway through something that it would be better in a different form or that, you know, I like some pieces of it, but not all of it. Um, I'm a head case. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, it, the title's already out there for mine, but um, so the novel I'm working on now is called The Paul Bearers Club. Oh, I um, love that, man. That's a great title. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, it might be one title that Jen's not going to try to to, to to make me change. <laughs> I love you, Jen. I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, so it's due to her in, in May. Um, I don't know if I'm about maybe 40% done-ish. Maybe. I'm not sure. So this book is, is going to be a lot different than the last two, um, Survivor Song and The Cabinet at the End of the World, because both of those really are a compressed timeline and very short novels and, you know, hopefully for the reader, quite intense. And this book has more room to breathe. It's it's being written as like a faux memoir. Um, mm. And it, you know, it starts in 1988 and it will not go all the way up to 2020. I don't think, at least not yet. Um, so that's yeah, funny. I one, mean, I guess that's all I want to say working, about that. Though. The one that I'm working on starts in uh, um, 1989. See, it, I'm and lucky. Also, and is also yeah. an accordion book in the sense of it starts in 89 and continues until about 2018. Yeah. I will say I've already I've already written my 2020 book. I happened to write it before. You know, Survivor Song is definitely a 2020 book. So, Seriously, um, yeah. I I had the idea for the Paul Bears Club last fall before everything, so that was nice too. Like you know, I just sort of let the idea stew for a little bit because I, I was writing uh, you know some short stories and some other stuff. So um, I don't know. I, I feel okay about it, but you know, like you were saying, in the middle of it, I don't know about you and me. In the middle of it, it's like I never think it's good. But I'm sort of used to feeling that way. So I'm at a point where it's like, I'm just going to muscle it through and then hopefully I figure it out at the end. I, I do think that there's a point with every story, and it doesn't matter whether it's a short story or a novel, when doubt sets in. You know, um, when you begin to think, mm, am I really <laughs> carrying this off? Um, and most of the time, I think you just have to, you know, that's, that is actually the essence of the job is you know, um, is to push through it. That, that, that the job is about carrying those self-doubts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, one of my earliest writer friends, mentors, Stuart Hernan, uh, now Joe, I know you know Stuart as well. Um, he used to tell me uh, early on, like he would literally belt himself into his chair. Like I'm, I'm going to be here for two hours. And he would literally put a belt around himself to keep him from getting up. Um, other, my other favorite Stuart Ann story I want to tell really quickly. When I was writing Disappearance of Devil's Rock, I was really struggling with it because, you know, in the glow of being done with a book, every book feels like, oh, yeah, that was kind of easy to write when you're done with it. Right. Like, so I had finished A Head Full of Ghosts. I was like, oh, that book was so easy to write. Disappearance of Devil's Rock is so hard. I think this sucks. You know, I sent Stuart this long email, you know, sort of looking for, hey, kid, you'll be okay. You, you know, it's a good, you know, you're a good writer, blah, blah, blah. He sent me back one line, but it was the perfect line. It was what I needed to hear. He wrote back, Eh, not everything. Not everything you're gonna write is gonna be great. <laughs> That's all he wrote. And I started laughing, and I, I just exhaled this big sigh, uh, you know, relief, and just. And then I went and wrote the rest of that book. It was very freeing. Funny. Yeah. Um, guys, I'm looking at the time. It looks like we've got about a minute and a half. Um, there's a little bit of a question about some research and how you guys approach that um, versus kind of making stuff up. Um, I'll just say briefly that, you know, I was nodding firstly when Paul talked about all the nonfiction he's listening to. I also listen to a lot of nonfiction. I think people dig podcasts and mm -hmm. I've listened to a couple podcasts, but I think a lot of times I'd rather listen to long form journalism, um, on a subject that might be helpful that I might, mm -hmm. it doesn't always have to be work adjacent, but I definitely do think that, you know, I find myself reading more and more nonfiction, um, and, yeah. And I do find myself doing research in the last few years, um, which is sort of new for me since usually I'm a bullshit artist. I just hate up as I go <laughs> along. Uh, yeah, I, with Survivor Song, I, I was fortunate that I had happened to listen to a book called Rabbit, A Cultural History of Rabies, like two years before I had the idea for Survivor Song. So I was like, oh, how am I going to do sort of a zombie-ish thing somewhat realistically? Oh, of course, rabies. Um, but I, I have to admit that I hate research. I dread it. I'm not good at it. 
I never trained in it. You know, I was a math major. Like, you know, no one really yeah. showed me besides, you know, way back in high school, which I don't remember how to do research papers. So I do it kicking and streaming, screaming, but you know, if it has to be done, it has to be done. I much prefer just to be in fiction land. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, we're right at 45 minutes. So uh, it's 8.15, and I guess that's time to start to wrap it up. Um, thanks so much for being a part of the talk and for participating in Southern Festival of Books. And uh, thanks a ton. R it's been great. RJ, thanks so much, and thanks everyone who tuned in to watch us. Yes, thank you, everybody. Thank you, RJ. Yeah, thanks.